Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I hope you had fun today and that you have learned a bunch. My name is Mark van Straten, and I work at Q42 in the Netherlands. I am the driving force behind Philips U being ran on Kubernetes. I attended this same conference in 2016 in London to make a technical assessment if we could start use it in production. At that moment in time, the 1.2 release of Kubernetes was almost around the corner, and I was looking for others like me who were trying to use it in production. What I found out was that not, man, not many people were using it in production, or if they did, not that much load was, putting on it, was being put, put on it. Uh, but what I did feel was lots of compassion, progression, and the tremendous effort of the community to bring Kubernetes where it is today. So when I came back to my office, I started our own research and our own migration of the Philips U Cloud towards Kubernetes. This talk is the culmination of our last year. I will talk a little bit about the transitions that the Philips U Cloud has uh, been, tr been put through, how we are running today, and what needed extra attention, and also the future promises that we are still looking into. Philips Lighting. You all know this product. It is light, pure, functional. You have it at your home or at your company. And Philips has originally developed this product, and we have been all using it for many years. But Philips envisioned that light can be so much more, that you could interact with light, that it could, prov could provide you with what you need when you need it, being it that you wake up, that you come home, that you have a party. So they started transforming the product, and they released Philips U in 2012. It was the world's first smart light bulb, cloud-connected, and it could change intensity and color. It is still the most popular smart home product today. The introduction of Philips U has, has done something very special. It has made something we all take for granted relevant again. Using sensors, routines, integrations, or Philips U compatible products, you will never have to touch a wall switch again. When we started the original development in 2012 on the Philips U cloud, we knew the value it would bring to you all as the customers. But the question which we could not answer was, how fast would you all catch on? How fast, fast would we need to scale? So we were searching for a solution which would provide us with a minimal cost per connected home and could scale rapidly. And we ended up using Google App Engine. We built a monolithic app using Java and the Play Framework version 1 so that you could interact with your light bulbs at home while you were not, while you were not at home. That was the primary use case at that moment. So latency was not a big concern because you could not observe the responses. In 2014, we started to observe growing pains because more and more integrations were coming along with the Philips U Cloud. And also, uh, we needed to iterate on our infrastructure because the, the, the Play Framework version 1 was deprecated. So we ended up on Compute Engine, which is now called Google App Engine Flex. It still has the great scalability metrics of Google App Engine, but it allows you a custom runtime, and we ended up with Node.js. We broke down our monolith into two tiers, the application-facing cloud API and the home-facing bridge API, and we glued them together with a Redis database. Then Kubernetes came along. When Google announced Google Container Engine, we were very interested, because this great combination would mean that we could yield the, the, the effort, uh, yield the, uh, yield the uh, benefits of Kubernetes of building true microservices and utilize the underlying resources much better while still keeping our operational efforts to a minimum. And this brings us to the present day. We started the migration of our platform at the beginning of the summer 2016. And we also started breaking apart our applications even further into smaller microservices, which is an effort which continues until today. All applications which want to interact with your home need to go through the uCloud API. This means, if this then that, 
Amazon Alexa, Google Home, but also the official U mobile app utilizes this cloud. And when you put a request to the cloud, for instance, to turn on your lights at home, we will, we will at first validate if the token that you have supplied us is valid and is authorized to connect with your home. If it's all, it's all well, we will push your command into our Redis database, which acts like a PubSub broker and has very basic information about your connection. And last, we will, notify our, we, we will utilize our backend notifier to notify the correct backend that we will need some information of your bridge and that a command needs to be invoked. The correct backend will then be invoked and we will communicate with your bridge at home so that your lights turn on. And the response, I have done this, is passed back through Redis all the way back to the application that originally made this request. And why do you have two backends, you might ask. When Philips, in originally in 2012, released Philips U, the bridge that came along with it was not that powerful. It could only communicate using HTTP requests to the outside world. We can wake it up. It will start pulling for commands to our cloud, and after some time, we'll go to standby mode again. The new bridge, as I've shown on this slide, is way more powerful and is able to, con to make a persistent WebSocket connection. This is much more faster and decreases the latency of the overall system significantly. The five services combined with this Redis database make up the core of the Philips U cloud. We are running one cluster in production only in Europe. This is mainly because of the data retention and privacy concerns that we have for our European customers. Alongside with the five services that I just mentioned, we have a few others making up a grand total of 10. And when I made these slides, we were using 40 nodes and having 120 pods. And now we are almost exceeding 200. We have a few virtual machines left, for instance, the Redis databases and some Google App Engine workload, which is getting offloaded more and more towards Kubernetes. This complete cloud infrastructure is developed and maintained by just merely five developers. So it is very important for us to keep our operational efforts to a minimum, utilizing powerful tooling. Otherwise, our development efforts would come to a grinding halt. We have faced many challenges while starting to use Kubernetes. At first, we needed to build trust upon the product. Many times have I heard my colleagues exclaim, what is Kubernetes doing for funky stuff to my code, to find out we were at fault. Gradually, these voices diminished. I want to share with you some of the lessons that we have learned using our specific type of workload on Google Container Engine. As I have mentioned, all communication with our cloud API is currently done using HTTP requests from the applications. The actual response to these requests is the actual response from your home. At any given time, there are multiple requests waiting for these responses, and it can take some time depending on how fast the bridge in your home wakes up and your total internet connection latency is. While we were running on Google App Engine, this was, a, was no problem. We had separate virtual machines. But on Kubernetes, your nodes will share basic things like the CPU, the memory, the network bandwidth, and also the underlying socket connections. During a particular latency-intensive evening, one of our pods saturated all its inbound connections, its and its outbound connections, and it, became, it, it spilled over to the node. So it, caused all sorts of trouble on the complete node. That postmortem was no fun to diagnose. To prevent these kinds of outages in the future, we have now implemented circuit breakers on all our external calls using Hysterix, originally developed by Netflix. For those of you who do not know what a circuit breaker does, whenever the error rate of our external services exceeds our threshold, the circuit breaker trips, and we stop making calls to our external service. Once a probe request succeeds, we will pick up our pace again and start making these calls again. This way, we prevent a spillover from failures cascading into our pod and influencing the whole node eventually. We are also we're searching for other ways to maximize the amount of sockets that we can utilize on our nodes. And we found out we need, that we needed to modify runtime settings 
for instance, like the NF contract or the TCP socket timeout duration. But when you are using Google Container Engine, Google manages your nodes. They are cattle. And this is a great thing because less operations means that I have got more time for development. So how do you manage, change your runtime settings of your nodes? And we ended up with a privileged pod running in a daemon set on every node. And because it is privileged, it has powers. It may change settings. This way, we keep Google in charge of our nodes, and we can overlay our own settings on top. We named our privileged pod King Kong, with a little bit of humor, because he has power to wreak havoc in our cluster. The link on this slide is our implementation. It's quite trivial, but it might give you a hint of what, what you can achieve if you use something like this. Another reason why we needed to deviate from the defaults Kubernetes provides you with is our Web WebSockets API. Once the bridge in your home powers on, it will initialize this WebSocket connection to our cloud. And this connection is kept open indefinitely. Unless you are using some external servers during Christmas, for instance, to turn your lights at home to red and green every second, this connection is idling. It's doing nothing, mostly during the day. That makes it very hard to scale using the default horizontal pod autoscaler because we are not consuming any, any CPU and memory because we're idling. We also wanted to do proactive scaling instead of retroactive scaling. We want to be ready and have a new pod ready to serve new traffic before we saturate all the connections that we can have. So we built a custom horizontal pod autoscaler. And also, again, building a, cost, uh, building a custom horizontal pod autoscaler is not that hard. It runs in our cluster as a pod alongside with the application that it needs to scale. It fetches a list of pods from our master node, and then it retrieves from every pod its current connection count. Using a polynomial regression algorithm, it then predicts the amount of replicas which are desired. And if it is more than we're currently having, scale up. If it is less than what we are currently having, we don't scale down. Last month, a big internet service provider in the Netherlands, Ziggo, had an outage. And we lost a significant amount of the Dutch traffic. But these bridges, they are not lost. They will come back. And we do not want to build a denial of service attack on ourselves. Even though that we have a running gag in our team that you're not on the team unless you have built a denial of service attack machine. <laughs> As our user base grew and our architecture evolved, we as a team also needed to evolve. We had to ingrain DevOps into our culture. You develop it, you ship it, you monitor it. We had also had to adopt the measure everything philosophy originally preached by Etsy. When we were running on Google App Engine, we had problems answering basic metric questions like, what is the 95th percentile of our response latency? While utilizing StatsD, we could emit these kinds of metrics from our applications to gain vastly more insights. This was also crucial for us in choosing Datadog as our monitoring solution on Kubernetes, because Datadog has native support for, for StatsD metrics. The kubectl command line combined with kubetail for logging and sprinkled with a bit of shell scripting is at this moment enough for us to manage our production environment. And we are in the lookout for a more more continuous uh, uh, solution. Because we had no metrics when we were running on Google App Engine, we resorted to log quite verbosely what our applications are doing. And I see this everywhere around me. And this is fine until you start using Google Container Engine or con Kubernetes at, at that. Things started smoking because the rate at which our applications were producing logs was just too much. The Fluentd pods were choking. So we have learned our lesson over there. We lost quite some logs. And since then, we have even more application metrics and reduced the amount of logs that we are emitting all the way back to only the unexpected application errors. These application errors are then logged using structured JSON and always enriched with our pod and node name. This way, we are able to correlate our logs if they originate from the same pod or from the same node. We use BigQuery for this, which gives us the free, super easy querying power. Looking at the future, 
we see that there are already a lot of features available or, or, in, the near, or in the near future become available. We want to decrease the latency of our US and Asian users by using cluster federation, which is something we are looking into. We would like to accumulate anonymous diagnostics data in batches and submit those to BigQuery using stateful sets combined with persistent volume claims. And it's always a good thing, and especially for us with such a small team, to decrease our operations. So we would love to have auto upgrades of our nodes so that we can scratch that from the list. And the disruption budget is easy because it allows you to configure a relative or absolute amount of pods which always need to be available. And this is important for voluntary scaling operations of your nodes. Uh, this feature is available in 1.7 release. It's already there, but it, it's getting extended. We have experienced that Kubernetes is great at resource allocation, lifecycle management, and containerizing your app. And all this invites you to build true microservices. I'm a developer at heart, and I don't mind to do operations with Kubernetes. The tooling and the configuration just feels very native to me. And as I've shown you with a few examples, the defaults of Kubernetes work great out of the box. But there are enough possibilities to override these and to extend them. It's limitless. And since I'm here, since we started, every release from the Kubernetes com community has felt like a gift full of new features. And I'm very grateful for that, and I would like to thank you all. Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> That's for you. But if there is one thing that I would like you to remember after this talk, great monitoring is paramount. Only then will you be able to keep your team small as we did, iterate fast, break things, diagnose those, and fix them, and continue delivering great software. I would like to thank you all for listening to my talk. I'll be here for the remainder from, of KubeCon, so if you've got any questions or things that you'd like to discuss, you can find me here or reach out to me online. I would love to chat about your setup and how it differs from ours, and how we might improve. Have a great evening and a wonderful KubeCon tomorrow. <laughs>